So with this video, we actually start to get into the, the meat, the, the main course, so to speak, of this, uh, this uh, course on um, the cooperative economy. And it's on, uh, basically, this begins the sixth chapter, chapter six, which is on democratic collective choice. This is actually a picture of me together with Sam Bowles at a conference in Berlin in 2017. Uh, not doing shameless self-promotion, but just um, Bowles is one of the uh, individuals who uh, inspired uh, my, I think in the background you actually see um, Milanovic, um, Branko Milanovic, who is also quite uh, influential with his uh, most recent book, uh, Capitalism Alone. But uh, anyway, um, Bowles here in the foreground speaking uh, with me is uh, one of my uh, main inspirations uh, to uh, choose or to stay rather with the field of economics and political economy in uh, an attempt to actually uh, do some some good and the socially relevant um, uh, discourse engaging in that. And um, anyhow, um, democratic collective choice is a, a topic that is relevant, I feel, due to the fact that um, the notions and paradigms of collective choice and public choice do not sufficiently emphasize the the um, the um, that aspect of, of of choice. The fact that uh, we do have different typologies of social organization. There are uh, democratic ones, and there are what I call coercive choice situations. So, before getting into the notion of democratic choice, I think it's important to have some primary uh, de definitions. And one of those uh, relates to the asymmetry uh, principle. But before I, I get to that, actually, uh, I'd like to make some prim preliminary remarks. And in this discussion on democratic choice, I do return to some of the events, ideas, and practices that um, were introduced in preceding uh, lectures, uh, as they are in preceding chapters of the uh, cooperative economy, that is chapters one to five. Um, and here I do aim to test the limits of the prevailing concepts from social and behavioral science, such as game theory and their ability to explain for the processes, environments, conditions, preferences, and behaviors involved in the unfolding of the democratic civic imaginary that I have outlined in pre previous uh, videos, uh, taking the notion of the civic imaginary from Cornelius Castoriadis, among others. Uh, and where the prevailing model is uh, not able to uh, sanguinely uh, explain for or account for these types of uh, scenarios, there is uh, likely a need for new concepts and models, just as uh, I've talked about the Copernican turn and with reference to Thomas Kuhn and Ludwig Beck's uh, contributions to the theory of science. Um, returning again to uh, the very, one of the first videos in module Two, or the first video in module two, where I discussed Buchstein's theories of uh, democracy, um, I am supplementing or beginning to supplement the normative and historical theories of democracy here with um, formal theories and models with the purpose of abstracting from the particular details uh, of, of, of situations to general lessons on the nature of democracy as a progressive evolution of self-governing groups of autonomous individuals within the context of cooperation. Uh, on the way, or as I make these uh, contributions, I uh, attempt to model the shifts in behavior associated with this unfolding imaginary. In different cases, I will draw on a number of research strands, including some work by Kiriazis and Metaxas on the evolution of democracy, as well as um, uh, some more fundamental research on the evolution of democracy from uh, Alex uh, Adamu and Ole Peters. And, um, and juxtaposing these with theories such as those proposed by Axelrod in his book on the evolution of cooperation. I'll learn more, or I'll try to uh, explain or expand more that the shared, on the notion of the shared experience that uh, people feel in, 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 in productive relationships can facilitate the development of trust, that strong reciprocity requires. Looking at uh, someone like John Elster who developed constraint theory to represent the notion that in some cases less is more meaning that constraints not only increase transaction costs as the transaction cost economics and 
other elements with new institutional econom economics have suggested, but that they can also, constraints can also provide a reduced horizon uh, by means of which socially beneficial outcomes are more likely to occur. In other words, in the language of relational economics, I will argue that constraints can serve to increase cooperative rents and decrease the cost of cooperation. And I'll also discuss the importance of democratic choice mechanisms, which I have introduced in prior videos. So again, first, this asymmetry principle. The findings and conclusions of the prior modules have revealed that certain pre-scientific biases uh, within the static ontology that we can attribute to individuals like Aristotle, Cicero, and others uh, ascribes factually incorrect qualities to labor and in fact undermines the advancement of the economy in terms of knowledge and high quality governance relationships. Nevertheless, despite many empirical findings, uh, most students of economics today actually still learn about produ production functions uh, and similar concepts which assume inputs of homogeneous units of capital and labor. Uh, these functions, which remind one in effect of the Catholic notion of the duality of the soul, usually give the impression that these inputs are indistinguishable besides being introduced by different actors, like water flowing into a tub from several valves. Applications like the cop douglas production function further reinforce this notion with its assumption of orthogonal qualities. Uh, notions like Lucas's stylized facts have not helped things either. Um, um, I've underlined in prior, prior videos the reasoning behind the relational perspective beyond looking at labor as only another name for human activity, which goes with life itself which in turn is not produced for sale, but is entirely uh, for, different, uh, for different reasons that, cannot, that activity cannot be detached from the rest of life, stored or immobilized. The relational perspective seeks a consequentialist argument for emphasizing a process-based view of economic relations, including multi-stakeholder dialogue. Uh, and it's an essential gain uh, that can be made from cooperation. And the question is to how to frame that, that approach that uh, frames the, the, the dialogue as to what can be gained from cooperation and what reasonable context of justification for it uh, might be developed. I think uh, Greg Dow's asymmetry principle, which he elaborates in his book, The uh, Labor uh, Managed Firm, can offer a useful starting point for such a context. When discussing the analytical differences between labor managed or what he calls labor managed and capital managed firms, we can use uh, cooperatives and investor-owned firms as, as stand-ins for those concepts. Uh, Dow speaks of LMFs for labor managed firms and KMFs for capital managed firms. Dow suggests that these cannot, the distinctions, empirical distinctions cannot all be attributed to market forces. Although they are necessary, he says, market imperfections are not sufficient to explain patterns like compressed wage structures, less elastic quantity responses to prices, because such imperfections may have symmetric effects on capital and labor managed firms or cooperatives and investor owned firms. Thus, one must find fundamental differences between capital and labor that in combination with market imperfections accommodate differences in practice between the two types of firms. Dow thus suggests that any theory claiming to explain the empirical asymmetries between cooperatives and investor own firms must identify a causally relevant asymmetry between capital and labor. Uh, applying Wittgenstein's lessons about, lessons about the language to labor would uh, therefore direct us to finding a lexicon of labor that is conceptually distinct from the language of capital. Thus, terms like social capital uh, should be avoided in favor of terms designed more explicitly to refer to the unique characteristics of labor as human agency. More, more importantly, labor is creative, spontaneous, adaptive, unpredictable, universal, extensive, unalienable, and lends itself to critical or deliberative rationalization. Meanwhile, or what has been called expressive rationals, rationality. Meanwhile, capital is created, ordered, predictable, fixed, indifferent, particular, intensive, and alienable. Like Turing's machine, human labor can be seen as a universal value as in principle, any human can perform any task any other human can perform, allowing in normal variations in strength, skill, and learning capability, as Cockshot has argued. 
Uh, Cockshut thus refers to human beings and uh, as hu universal labor machines, a play on Turing's own universal Turing machine or UTM. I next continue on the topic of the development of preferences, which many economists have uh, basically uh, ignored. Um, so in keeping with the appeal in the prior module for a pluralistic uh, vision of the economy, actually this was in uh, module one, it is important to incorporate learning and preference formation into such a vision. Neoclassical economists have long avoided preference formation for the stylized facts like the model of the representative agent, etc. Uh, I do agree with uh, Amatya Sen that there is a somewhat, that this is a somewhat narrow position to take, that the genesis of individual preferences may indeed be relevant for postulating rules for collective choice, and that the appropriateness of alternative rules of collective choice will depend partly on the precise structure of the society in question. Thus, in keeping with the endogenous preferences tradition, in post-Walrasian political economy I've outlined in prior videos, I below or in the immediate, uh, I immediately outlined some pertinent areas that do provide necessary and sufficient conditions for the evolution of democracy. In particular, until recently, mainstream economics has failed in this regard. The neoclassical model as described in prior videos is guilty of the Samuelsonian bias, as has been called by Duncan Foley, of fitting reality to model rather than vice versa. Only since the advent of behavioral economics has any progress uh, arguably been made in rendering the discipline fit for dealing with the particularities of human life. Understanding the cognitive and behavioral underpinnings of social and individual behavior has benefited the relevance and generality of the once parochial neoclassical rock garden. It has also, via the slow take up of what economists refer to as norm based rationality, a reformulation of the Kantian imperative, equipped itself again finally after the neoclassical winter sleep to deal with change. Economists in recent decades have tried studying self organization of commonly owned resources. Uh, there, have been, there has been some progress in connecting these precepts with the program, as was shown in the discussion of Eleanor Ostrom's work in Module 1, but a general toolkit for describing and interpreting human cooperation remains, remains relatively weak compared to that studying competition and outright warfare. Thus, I do attempt uh, below, uh, in the immediate uh, following to begin to formulate a general economic theory of cooperation. Aspiring to become a theory granular enough to account for cultural differences is it must first consider the development of preferences and go beyond the vagaries of uh, notions like Hayek's that people respond like iron filaments to policy interventions. Hayek's great doubt about the knowability of the economy, uh, it is argued, has largely been overcome and superseded and through computational power, and we do know increasingly more about, firstly, the cognitive basis of individual behavior, while at the same time, uh, computing power has developed to such an extent that we are nowadays able to understand the various flows of the macroeconomy with a level of precision not available in the immediate post-war era. The development of preferences is thus an integral part of interpreting social choice in a dynamic situation, or in dynamic situations, rather, and th this uh, part of the lecture rather uh, derives a few fundamental ideas towards this end. I'll ask above all questions of to what extent a more explicit consideration of preference formation can enable an engagement with a view towards transformation. In particular, how can the growing knowledge pool on preference formation help outline implications for democratic choice? How does social learning, moral development, and the indeterminacy of large parts of social life impact the role of collective representations and practices, as Fouquet has called them? Firstly, I'd like to move to uh, Andrew Bandura, uh, who, for whom social learning is related to Piaget's notion of, of development, except for its inclusion of vicarious learning. Uh, vicarious learning develops for Bandura largely from observing the environment, and thus for him, personality uh, was not simply co determinants of behavior, but these two, uh, personality and behavior, are in turn shaped by and impact the environment and are impacted by the environment. Bandura refers to this recip as reciprocal determinacy. Bandura's pioneering work on aggression published in 1973, 
demonstrated clearly that complex interactions at various levels determine, shape, and reinforce aggressive behavior, both individually and socially. His work in this field helped to move away from the behavioral cul-de-sac in which post-war psychology found itself in and which could be represented by B.F. Skinner's notion of impulse stimulation. Bandura's perspective is influenced by a number of theses, including that limiting the scope of scientific inquiry to certain psychological processes to the neglect of other more or other important ones uh, can reinforce a truncated image of, the human, of human potential. Moreover, Bandura emphasized the need to work with clear and transparent concepts when describing or analyzing human behavior. As when one is assessing the results of psychological inquiry, it would be more helpful to know the therapist's conceptual belief system than the client's actual psychological status. Thus, according to Bandura, much of the research on behavioral and environmental interactions is described as not especially informative because one can obtain almost any pattern of results depending upon the types of persons, behavior, and situations selected. For example, in deciding which movie to attend from many alternatives in a large city, there are few constraints on the individual so that personal preferences emerge as the predominant determinants. In contrast, if people are immersed in a deep pool of water, their behavior will be remarkably similar, however uniquely varied they might be in their cognitive and behavioral makeup, argues Bandura. Thus, in opposition both to the radical behavioralists like Skinner and traditional humanism, Bandura advocates for a notion of reciprocal determinacy, which abandons the view that the environment is an exogenous determinant of individual or social behavior. In particular, this view suggests that though the potential environment is identical for all individuals, the actual environment depends upon their behavior. Bandura thus rendering the interaction between behavior and environment a two-way regulatory system in which the organism appears either as an object or as an agent of control, depending on which side of the reciprocal process one chooses to examine. Ultimately, for Bandura then to elucidate the process of reciprocal interaction between personal and environmental influences, one must analyze how each is conditioned on that of the other. This for Bandura involves uh, including such factors as role prescriptions, which serve as structuring influences on the nature of reciprocal exchange. I close this discussion of reciprocal determinism with the following illuminating passage from Bandura. Uh, this is from a 1977 book on social learning theory. Contrary to the unidirectional view, human accomplishments result from reciprocal interaction of external circumstances with a host of personal determinants, including endowed potentialities, acquired competencies, reflective thought, and a high level of self-initiative. A suitable relational framework must take account of such matters. Reporting in progress. The next topic refers to uh, the work by Kiriasis and Metaxas. Uh, I do adopt their notion of macroculture as a tool to describe a combination of uh, firstly mechanisms for aligning social with individual preferences, as well as secondly, the means by which preferences develop endogenously. In other words, uh, I argue that a macroculture comprises both the necessary soft institutions required to engender a particular behavioral profile, as well as the cultural values which thereby are engendered. There is a growing literature that agrees that so-called macrocultures guide actions and create typical behavior among independent but interdependent, or rather autonomous but interdependent entities so that they coordinate their activities in order that complex tasks may be completed. This happens in three ways. Firstly, uh, by creating a convergence, as the author so suggests, of expectations. Secondly, by allowing for idiosyncratic language to summarize complex routines and information. And thirdly, by specifying broad tacitly understood rules for appropriate actions under unspecified contingencies. In particular, uh, what I found most interesting about this literature, and to go get back into the th three categories of democ democratization or democracy and economics literature, uh, this, this literature critiques uh, pre-existing economic theories of dem democratization such as that by Asimoglu and Robinson, 
as being unidimensional and overly simplistic. Here, uh, Kediasis and Metaxas, in fact, are in agreement with the larger body of work, including that by Bowles and Gintis. Most of this literature uh, that has been critiqued uh, is concerned with the relationship between uh, political and economic institutions and their impact on providing for trust and ultimately the causal relation between that and cooperation. The model which Kediasis and Metaxas develop turns this issue on its chronological head, showing how specific coordination and cooperation mechanisms develop trust in one domain which is taken over then in democratic politics. So in fact, cooperation here is the causal or explanatory variable that impacts the creation of trust that then in itself allows for the development of new political and economic institutions. It's thus an endogenous model for the social evolution of cooperation. Uh, to go into the model more specifically, the authors do adopt a variation of Simon's notion of bounded rationality uh, that then suggests that human beings collectively congregate in order to achieve simpler solutions to problems. And once uh, we, or as individuals, have found solutions to a particular problem that are perceived to be adequate, such as uh, Simon's notion of satisficing, when facing a new problem, uh, people or individuals try to use the established and known rules of the game, the known knowledge uh, that is in possession in order to solve the new problem. This is, in a way, the notion of heuristics. This again reduces the effort and time consumed, which is important due to the brain's capacity limitation. Only if human beings do not find an adequate solution using the existing knowledge, and if the problem that is faced is serious enough, do individuals devote time and effort to find new solutions. Once these have been found, individuals have increased the, their total learning and knowledge. Satisficing behavior thus diffuses not known solutions and problem-solving rules to new uh, practical issues. You can look at climate change as such an example, for instance. The rules of the game traditionally have been GDP growth, but we see now how GDP growth is colliding against the uh, basic foundations of a uh, livable planet. Secondly, the authors adopt the methodological uh, perspective of the macroculture, meaning they abstract from individual agency and view organizational behavior as emergent from social coordinating activity. This means that the authors subsequently interpret bounded rationality not merely as individual, psycholog an individual psychological phenomenon, but also as a behavioral mechanism, a channel for the transportation and transformation of ideas, norms, values, customs, uh, and such that have emerged in one area of a macroculture into other areas. Of course, the image on the right on the bottom uh, depicts the evolution of macrocultures from single individuals who behave uh, in a new way, uh, in a novel way, as uh, then subsequently to the development of certain units of macrocultures that then influence the general uh, social unit uh, more explicitly. The point being that from e pluribus plubur, e unum, as the model of the United States is for out of many one. So you see individuals who collectively share values, norms, and, and viewpoints, heuristics, then ultimately simplify uh, their response to certain changes in the environment and have a shared uh, vision. And it's important to remark that this uh, notion of macroculture is in fact an endorsement of a network approach. Next, uh, I cover the notion of gene cultural evolution and its uh, reference to the evolution of macroculture. In fact, the mechanism by which these types of factors propagate and maintain themselves is relevant for economic discourse in that the existence of markets and modern states, for instance, requires a large degree of trust and reciprocity among citizenry. 
This makes a nuanced view of the evolution and maintenance of reciprocal altruism, that is altruistic behavior that results from the expectation that it may be reciprocated in the future, quite central to modern economic theory. Thus, the research of archaeologists, biologists, and anthropologists is vital in this regard is vital for the progress of economic theory in determining the uh, prior conditions for social institutions such as markets to survive. I discussed some of this research in module one, as well as in some of my prior publications. Next, looking at role models, one of the oft overlooked antecedents for any behavioral type, including democracy, is role models. There is something to be said about first mover or pioneer strategies. In fact, authors like Eleanor Ostrom have discussed the benefit of uh, common resource pool pioneers have had on initiating their own projects when precedents to exist to be learned from. Greg Dow also remarks upon the importance of bad role models in accounting for the lack of, in his example, new plywood and reforestry cooperatives in the American Pacific Northwest. Thus, in the cooperative economy, I devised two, two models referring to, respectively uh, to one as the vanguard and the other as the whistleblower model to describe the role of role models in social learning. Both show, in fact, how macrocultures can evolve. One of these involves, of course, a group of individuals who use positive uh, reinforcements or positive uh, incentive structures that eventually catch on and are ultimately replaced with negative incentive structures. And the second refers to single individuals who blow the whistle on certain uh, immoral or otherwise illegitimate practices, uh, in effect, breaching a blockade of the transmission of information in a particular search situation that allows the general public to then judge uh, what is uh, correct or what should be done in the future. Next, looking at the impact of uh, collective discount rates and uh, the relationship between these to individual discount rates. Uh, in alignment with uh, Amitai Etzioni's call for co-determined motivational function that I've introduced in module one, I do call for the including norms into any model claiming to account for people's intertemporal behavior. For instance, as regards saving behavior, Etzioni argues future consumption cannot motivate present saving because it does not generate present pleasure, but does inflict the pain of self-denial, that is saving inflicts pain and not pleasure. Saving behavior is thus to be viewed as a conflict not between consuming now and consuming later, but between consuming now and abiding with commitments to moral values to which the actors are committed in the same time frame that is now. The benefit of this framing of the issue of discount rates is that it easily allows us to conceive of and model mechanisms by means of which to augment both individual and collective discount rates in accordance with social priorities. It can be seen that the neoclassical growth models of Salo and Spawn fail the test of accounting for dynamic changes in social priorities as they are micro-founded on the mainstream microeconomic models described in prior videos that is, they take the individual discount rates as given and either aggregate these or abstract, uh, which is much worse, using a so-called representative agent. Any social or technological shifts are only included as a residual that lies outside the model's purview as exogenous factors. Thus, instead of asking how individual discount rates transfer to a collective level, Following the notion of downward translation developed by Max Grahe recently, the question can best be answered by reversing it. How are collective discount rates and priorities transferred to the individual level? It appears that law, customs, norms, religious observance, and groupthink are all forms of this process. Another aspect of this discussion is, uh, has been brought to attention recently with uh, work by Ole Peters and others. A big problem in the micro-founded theories is in fact called the ergodicity problem. As discussed by Ole Peters and others, ergodicity assumes identity between what is called the ensemble and time averages. Um, if we assume that a process reflect, reflecting certain parameters is non-ergodic, that means that these two averages, the ensemble and time averages, are not symmetrical. Two income streams or discount rates under such an assumption would in all likelihood be entirely different from what an ergodic model would predict. An example of this would be 
uh, a waging a bet on a roll of the dice or a toss of a coin, uh, the uh, an ensemble average would predict a theoretical in unlimited re repetition of this activity, which in fact would find a increase uh, slowly over time of the uh, winnings of the earnings, wh whereas the time average would take the actual empirical coin tosses over time and average those, which in all likelihood might see a reduction of the earnings over time, such that the firm former problem of the ensemble average is in itself only of theoretical interest being that if you lose your money in a coin toss, you have no way to simulate uh, an infinite amount of coin tosses. That is, uh, over time, the time, uh, on, uh, the time average will tend to towards zero as you lose more and more money. The problem with standard uh, neoclassical uh, and offshoots treatments of economic behavior is the general assumption of independence of individual behavior. Thus, generally, there is at most accepted a mild stochasticity, as suggested by uh, Mark Kirstein or by uh, Fairhoon and Mahover in their uh, seminal work, The Laws of Chaos. In this version of events, individuals choose based on exogenous preferences exposed to a random shock that symbolizes the hand of stochasticity barely entering the discussion. However, most human behavior is dependent on that of others and humans are entwined in networks, as I've discussed above with co-determination, the role of norms in determining our behavior, such as savings behavior. Thus, real behavior is complex and partly interdependent, so that such elegant assumptions, while mathematically erudite, have little bearing on human affairs, at least at the level of complexity of human networks uh, as that level belies any ability to capture relationships in such a way, at least as far as the analysis considers those relationships. In other words, complementarity and compatibility of complete determinism at an intermediate, say, mesoscopic level and condensed matter and the everyday world, how it surrounds us, and the need for probabilistic treatments of whole economies and dynamic systems on the macroscopic level on the one hand, as well as at the microscopic level of individual decision makers and subatomic particles on the other hand. Uh, as Kirstein argues, we find determinism and pure causality embedded in an unstable Goldilocks state between layers of contingency and stochasticity. These conclusions, of course, cast into, into doubt the idea of a fully informed subject comparing various states in the ensemble and basing decisions on the maximization of an expectation value. As I was saying about the coin toss example, you cannot abstract from yourself into an infinite number of states and compare those states and choose the best one as the time is involved and your fate is determined by what occurs in, those, in the intermediate. In fact, it recalls into question the idea of optimization as uh, a criterion for dis uh, decision-making per se. Uh, Lucio Bighiero has uh, critiqued the notion of optimization in complex systems as impossible. Following such thinking, uncertainty is a radical fact and one which must be embedded into social systems in some way. Moreover, social systems, especially those humans have built and are a part of, have a degree of self-reflection and learning embedded in them. Thus, the social uh, systems and their downward translation to the individual is the result of a long process or long processes rather of social learning and reflection under radical uncertainty. Such systems should therefore be seen as assets and the downward translation as a form of intergener intergenerational endowment. Thus, we must speak of dynamics, the introduction of degrees of freedom, and the emergence and emergent results that these stipulate. Thus, when discussing issues of collective choice, it appears increasingly questionable to derive theories from a mere aggregation of static individual preferences. Moreover, the picture of human nature associated with such an aggregation does not consider the above observation that social acti action is not independent, uh, as I've stated previously. Thus, individual action and choice must be constrained by collective needs and vice versa. There may not be a general rule as to how these parameters should be grouped or in which hierarchy. However, 
Once we develop clearer typologies of collective choice, as I've done, or as I'm doing in this chapter, in this lecture, such as democratic versus coercive choice, concessio versus translatio, etc., the way to develop a more general taxonomy of approaches relative to a type becomes more conceivable. Next, I would like to look at uh, uh, constraint theory, which uh, is, has been developed uh, by John Elster. Echoing Kurt Schumacher's claim that small is beautiful, political scientist John Elster has called for a rethinking of collective choice theory, claiming that in many situations of social interaction, less is more. That frequently constraining actors' choices can have a socially preferable outcome. Elster argues that many are the potential benefits of constraints, including avoiding temptation or to make ourselves unable to succumb to, to it when we meet it, restricting passions as well as employing passions as a means of pre-commitment against temptations, enabling rationality via contract law or resisting the excessive focus on the present that is characteristic of hyperbolic discounting. Um, and hyperbolic discounting is re represented on, in the image on the right that I will get to in a moment. But one of the most important questions to be asked before proceeding is how people actually discount in practice, says Elster. Neoclassical economists usually assume that discounting is exponential in the sense that the welfare uh, T units in time, say two units in time in the future, is discounted to pr present value by a factor of R times two in this case, or T, where R is less than one is the one period discount factor. This is typically given as exogenous. However, a growing literature within experimental psychology and related fields in the behavioral sciences argues that discounting is hyperbolic so that welfare two or however many units into the future is discounted to present value by a factor of one plus k times t or whatever, whichever the time unit is, two, with k being greater than zero. Intuitively, the implication of this would be that individuals have a strong preference for the present compared to all future dates, but are much less concerned with the relative importance of future dates. Hyperbolic discounting has several socially undesirable outcomes with respect to present debates on climate change. The widespread presence of such present-oriented thinking would act as a hindrance to effectively mitigating catastrophic climate change. One can think of many more reasons to avoid hyperbolic discounting from addiction to unsuitable, unsustainable debt levels. Certainly, if individuals tend to discount hyperbolically, then collective institutions with their mutual monitoring and other means of downward translation would be in a position to elicit more desirable outcomes. Just to represent this in the graph on the left, you see here two different income streams. Number one in the Roman numerals being, and of course we have two, three time periods. Number one being a, uh, in the end, smaller endowment that results from that income stream. That is, however, received more quickly, as you do see at its peak in uh, period two. And endowment number two, represented by the Roman numeral two, has a slower rise in the endowment, but an ultimately greater result in the endowment in period three. Now, according to hyperbolic discounting, the individual is looking at period T star at the bottom, and this is the period in which the endowment number one actually uh, uh, crosses that of two and uh, becomes greater. Now, somebody who hyperbolically discounts in period zero or in period one would usually prefer endowment number one because you get more sooner rather than, uh, or I could say less sooner than more later. This is typical behavior that is, can be seen in nature uh, in human beings and among others in many other life forms and animals. 
And now it's arguable that what institutions do in this scenario is to stretch out our time horizon and allow us to enjoy the fruits of the greater endowment of number two rather than the more immediate gratification of endowment number one. Now, this also can be represented through the notion of time inconsistency, which is related to many of the topics discussed uh, in the immediately preceding. Time inconsistency occurs when the best policy currently planned for some future period is no longer the best when that period actually arrives. Now, Elster adds to this definition that the preference reversal involved in time inconsistency is not caused by exogenous and unforeseen changes in the environment, nor by a subjective change in the agent over and above the reversal itself. The reversal is caused by the mere passage of time. This notion of time inconsistency should remind of the discourse around ergodicity economics. Again, as emphasized in the above, Rather, in the prior, learning can play a large role in ameliorating these conditions. Once we learn that we are subject to time inconsistency, we may take steps to deal with it to prevent the reversal from occurring or from having adverse consequences for behavior. One of the more interesting implications of constraint theory is the hypothetical impact of constraints on discounting behavior. I asked uh, earlier uh, the question of how individual discount rates differ from collective ones and how the latter emerge. And at present, I will argue following Elster that one of the primary instrumental functions of groups and collective agency is the extension of discount rates from the individual where frequently hyperbolic or quasi hyperbolic discount rates are observed. Thus, I intend to interpret social institutions as a means of escaping the volitional quandary of learning to die in time discount. As Elster puts it, we cannot expect people to take steps to reduce their rate of time discounting because to want to be motivated by a long-term concern ipso facto is to be motivated by that long-term concern. Just as to expect that one will expect something to happen is to expect that it will happen or to want to become immoral is to be immoral. So there's a bit of a chicken and egg problem here. Uh, Martin Luther King, it reminds me of a quote of his, also said that it is impossible to pull yourself up by your bootstrap, bootstraps if you have no boots. So in fact, institutions in this uh, image represent the boots that human beings use to uh, uh, basically change the, their behavior and engage in the process of social learning. Uh, one of the elements of constraint theory also is the distinction between types of constraints. There are, according to Elster, both incidental and essential constraints. Essential constraints are those that an agent imposes on him or herself for the sake of some expected benefit to him or herself. Uh, on the other hand, incidental constraints have an incidental character, meaning they are constraints that benefit the agent who is constrained, but that are not chosen by the agent for the sake of those benefits. The essential constraint is easier to understand and has been studied in the long tradition of social contract theory from Aristotle to John Rawls. More interesting for the purposes at present is the notion of incidental constraint and in fact how such constraints once in place may become learned, acquired, and transformed into essential constraints. As Elster comments, an agent may be unable to find, make himself unable to act in a certain way, and yet find him or herself constrained to his or her benefit by the force of circumstances or through an act of another agent. Thus, individuals may, in such cases, actively seek to be bound by others. A famous example which Elster appropriates for the book's title uh, which is called Ulysses Bound, uh, which continually resurfaces throughout his book, is the incident from the Odyssey in which Odysseus is to have his crew fill their ears with soft beeswax so that he may hear the beautiful song of the sirens, but that his crew must bind him. And if he is asked to be unbound, let his crew bind him all the tighter. Uh, Constraints, according to Elster, are also a two-step process. They uh, start with a choice of constraints, and secondly, choice under those constraints. 
This notion of a two-step process relates also to Kant's third critique, his critique of judgment, in which Kant discusses the evolution of judgment of art or science, resulting firstly in a categorization um, of genius, and that in fact it is genius who first stipulates the conditions that refer to art, followed by the creation of other works of art in that category. So the example that Elster uses in his book that, or one of the examples that he uses to refer to this two-step process is the Hayes Code in Hollywood. So after 1934, uh, the, um, there was a uh, move to institute a form of censorship in Hollywood films that resulted in more strict guidelines as to what was acceptable. Um, and in this case, the Hayes Code can be seen as the choice of constraint and films that were made after 1934 can be seen as a choice under that constraint. Next, I wanted to talk about the role of and limitations of game theory and um, with reference to some elements of the lit literature that I discuss in the cooperative economy. Uh, since the 1950s, the late 1950s, social norms have been interpreted by game theorists as Nash equilibria, as Herbert Ginters points out. He continues that some other issues with this view uh, are the conditions under which rational individuals play a Nash equilibrium, uh, describing these as extremely demanding, and they are not guaranteed, he suggests, to hold simply because there is a social norm specifying a particular Nash equilibrium. Secondly, Gintis critiques the notion of the Nash equilibrium, suggesting that the most important and obvious social norms do not, in fact, specify Nash equilibria at all, but rather are devices that implement correlate, correlated equilibrium. Robert Aumann uh, first described a coordinated equilibrium, which places very few restrictions on the possible outcomes, according to Aumann the thinking being to move away from the demanding conditions of a Nash equilibrium. The results are quite robust. Thus, while, argues Gintis, while rationality and common priors do not imply a Nash equilibrium, these assumptions do imply correlated equilibrium. I do agree with mental states that, are, that these are publicly inaccessible as they entail private information. Thus, uh, we typically have no exogenous knowledge about the preferences of others. Nevertheless, if we maintain a commonly shared prior belief and associate that belief with some commonly shared signal, then this signal can simultaneously act to choreograph individuals' behavior and serve as a cue for the respective common prior. Here, it does not ultimately matter if that prior is an endogenous or exogenous, just as it does not necessarily matter if a constraint is incidental or essential, as the issue relates to the relationship between common knowledge and the existence of a correlated equilibrium. I next wanted to get into some of the problems with traditional economic models like econometrics, with notions like p-values and asymptotic assumptions, and so on. Uh, although I reserve most of this for the actual text of the dissertation that is very involved and technical, um, so I do recommend this uh, passage from chapter six, that I think is uh, six six point six, um, and would just restrict my comments here to uh, referring to Elsasser and Prigonia's criticisms that much of uh, modern probability and statistics uh, does not take into consideration the indeterminacy and uniqueness that is uh, inherent in complex systems. Um, I get into some of this more in, in the, uh, one of the next videos and would at this point merely refer to the critique of game theory and leave it at that. Thus, as Gintis remarks, providing a plausible game theoretical model of cooperation amongst self-regarding agents would vindicate met methodological individualism and render economic theory virtually independent of and foundational to the other behavioral disciplines. In fact, this project is not a success, argues Gintis, 
A fully successful approach is likely to require a psychological model of social preferences and a social epistemology, as well as an analysis of social norms as correlating devices that choose amongst a plethora of Nash equilibria and choreograph the actions of heterogeneous agents into a harmonious operational system. Robert Alman uh, complements this with a statement that we see that both the non-cooperative and the cooperative theory involve agreement amongst the players, the difference being only in that in one case, the agreement is self-enforcing, whereas in the other case, it must be externally enforced. Agreement usually involves communication so that we conclude that communication normally takes place in non-cooperative as well as cooperative games. Uh, my criticism, of course, is to the notion external in this statement, and it's only external to the model, and would suggest that one of the problems with game theory as well is its reference to interaction as games. Uh, um, here, it was, I believe, Kenneth Arrow who suggested that bargaining or games were only one logic by which a collective choice occurs, the others being authority and consensus. So in fact, there's much problems with the traditional notion that is inherent in game theory, and we should not assume it to be a valid statement about the world. There are many other criticisms that could be made uh, as to its legitimacy, uh, particularly with re relevance to the notion of counterfactuals, the role of simulations, the idea of iterative approaches, the importance of communication, and many other issues that I go into in the cooperative economy. Firstly, I would like to uh, draw some attention to uh, passages in a fascinating historical work on the rise of game theory by Steve Himes, entitled John von Neumann and Norbert Wiener, From Mathematics to the Technologies of Life and Death. Himes suggests that von Neumann and Morgenstern, who were amongst the founders of the discipline that became known as game theory, in their theory of economic behavior, assume that the aim of all participants in the economic system, consumers as well as entrepreneurs, is money or equivalently a single monetary commodity. This is supposed to be identical and even in, in a quantitative sense with whatever satisfaction or utility is desired by each participant. The von neumann morgenstern theory, suggests Himes, is thoroughly static in the sense that the objective of each player remains rigidly fixed throughout the economic conflict. Also implicit is the fixed nature of the interest each player pursues throughout the period when a policy is in effect. Although in practice, the identity of a player can shift from, from one group, individual, or department within the organization to another. Moreover, the available options remain fixed throughout the course of the game, as well as the rules of economic activity and the preference of each player. He continues that other players are seen as enemies, competitors, or collaborators, depending on the degree of mutual compatibility of their objectives. This is the norm in game theory. The harshness of this Hobbesian picture of human behavior is repugnant to many, but von Neumann would much rather err on the side of mistrust and suspicion than to be caught in wishful thinking about the nature of people and society. The recommended style of playing the economic game, the emphasis on caution, on calculation of expected consequences, the whole utilitarian emphasis aptly expresses the characteristic ideals of the middle class and capitalist societies. It is nearly the antithesis of the values of, for example, creative subcultures, bohemians, and it is also at variance with the attitudes predominant amongst aristocratic classes and the poor. As in those cases of elixirs of immortality that killed many a Chinese emperor up to the 11th century, the efficacious instrument may be highly desirable, but to mistake pseudoscience for science is highly dangerous. The game theoretic formulation in economics seems to lend itself most naturally to the ideal of oligopolistic capitalism. However, for an economics primarily concerned with social justice, with the distribution 
of wealth, to permit satisfaction of minimal human needs, and with the humanitarian values generally, game theory is at best an extremely awkward formulation. Rationality enters into game theory through the method, not the purpose. It is only a narrow, technical, instrumental kind of rationality, which can be made to serve the most irrational ends. As Weisskopf remarked about the notion of scarcity that drives uh, the epistemological foundation of game theory, there is a continuous gap between means and ends. The idea as applied to economics is historically relative and culture bound and represents the special orientation of industrial society toward economic activity and material need satisfaction. Thus, Weisskopf concludes, human life is confronted with an allocation problem, not only in respect to material means of production, the resources which are ultimately scarce are life, time, and energy because of human finitude, aging, and mortality. There is, however, a question of whether allocation and econo economizing and decisions about preferences may not have to be made even with immortality uh, and eternal youth, as long as we are subject to the limitations of time and space. Whatever, whatever our situations, we can actualize only limited desires here and now. And in fact, it can be said about von Neumann personally that he liked to use game theoretic conceptions to describe practical situations in everyday life, and at times was given to nearly instant, seemingly effortless calculations and evaluations of tactical situations based on game theoretic kind of thinking. So he was a homo economicus, which may not apply to everyday people in empirical situations. I conclude this overview of the history of game theory with reference to a quote by John von Neumann himself, who said in a speech in 1955, that the indications are that the best that mechanization will do for a long time is to supply mechanical aids for decision making, while the process itself must remain human. The human intellect has many qualities for which no automatic approximation exists. The kind of logic involved, usually described by the word intuitive, is such that we do not even have a decent description of it. Thus, a consummately cooperative economy requires more than just coordination a la Aumann. It requires sharing information, developing shared values and expectations, and planning so as not to waste resources as pure market mechanisms inevitably do via redundant capacity and costs created as a result of cyclical booms and busts. As has been pointed out, it is frequently impossible to derive true counterfactuals in a dynamic social world. However, interventions can be planned and evaluated on the basis of shared criteria. This requires moving beyond mere seeing to doing in the language of Pearl. Causality, according to Pearl, deals with how probability functions change in response to influences, such as new conditions or interventions that originate from outside the probability space. While probability theory even when fully given a fully specified joint density function on all temporarily indexed variables in the space, cannot tell us how that function would change under such external influence. Thus, doing is not reducible to seeing, and there's no point in trying to fuse the two together. Uh, with regard to necessary and sufficient causes, I can say about necessary causes that they represent the probability that events Y would not have occurred in the absence of event X, given that X and Y did in fact occur, uh, can be represented in, in the following way. What is the probability that a worker at a company recently converted to a democratic governance structure who reports having higher feelings of self-efficacy after the shift would not have experienced such increased feelings of self-efficacy if the company had remained the same? Thus, necessary causes are represented by counterfactual logic and thus quite difficult to test in social settings. Sufficient causes, on the other hand, represent the probability that setting X would produce Y in a situation where X and Y are in fact absent. Thus, it measures the capacity of X to produce Y. It is represented in the following way. What is the probability that a worker in a firm with a coercive governance structure would experience higher self-efficacy if the firm were to introduce a democratic governance mechanism? 
Thus, sufficient conditions also imply counterfactual thinking, but reverse the arrangement. Lastly, the notion of necessary necessity and sufficiency stands for the probability that Y would respond in X in both ways, and therefore measures both the sufficiency and the necessity of X to produce Y. Thus, necessary and sufficient conditions would rep be represented by the question of the probability that both a worker in a firm converting to a democratic structure would increase their self-efficacy and at the same time the probability that if the firm were not to convert its structure would not experience any increase. So in the next video I will go into the details of the necessary and sufficient conditions of um, democracy and then get into some of the democratic values that I derived in the cooperative economy.